Over the last few weeks, we have been talking about the reality that for so many of us, Christmas has really become a season filled with hustle and bustle. It's kind of an acknowledgement that this is a crazy, chaotic season where when we look at it, our calendars have become filled up, our uh, relationships are often overrun, and we're searching, we're trying to find some sense of peace within this season. And the truth is, that's something that all of us desire in our life. All of us desire to find peace. Now, the reality is, we go about it differently. There's certain certain things that we think will lead to peace. We search after those things, hoping to find what we believe peace is. But at the end of the day, what we really want is to make sense of life, to find some level of peace in this existence in the world that we live in. Now, the thing is, this isn't a new story for us. This is a story that has been throughout the pages of of the Bible. It's a story that has played out throughout history. As a matter of fact, tonight, that's one of the things I want to talk about, is how do we find peace in the midst of this crazy life? And to do that, we're going to be looking at the book of Matthew. Now, Matthew is one of the Gospels. It's another way of saying it's one of the stories. It's one of the stories that tell us about the life and the work of Jesus. And as we join with that story tonight, just for some context sake, I want to make sure you know where we're at. Like, when we join with the story, Mary has given birth to Jesus. They have traveled, Mary and Joseph have traveled down to Bethlehem. And as all of this is going on, as they're cherishing up this moment with their newborn child, this is what we read beginning in Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Now the thing is, the identity of the Magi is one of those things that has often been debated. We don't know a lot about it. We think we know things about the Magi. Really we know it because songs tell us it. So we sing songs that talk about how there were three Magi or three kings or three wise men. That this is sort of the the framework to we get some of our information about this first scene. But the reality is we don't know. We don't know if there was two. We don't know if there was ten. We don't know if there was two dozen. We don't know if they were wise men or if they were kings. We don't know any of that. What we do know is that they've traveled from a distant land to get to where they're at. They've traveled from some distant land to come to Jerusalem. And when they arrive in Jerusalem, we're told that King Herod is sort of the ruling person in that area. Now, King Herod is important for us. He's going to be one of the main characters we're going to be talking about in this story tonight. And what's important for us to understand is that the way that Herod got his power was that he was placed in that role. He was what was considered to be a client king that was put in power by the Roman Empire. And honestly, it was a pretty sweet gig for Herod. Like, it was, it was an enjoyable gig. He got to basically do whatever he wanted. He had all the freedom that he wanted. Like, all the joys of being a king without any of the responsibilities. Like, when it came to protecting the empire, when it came to expanding the empire, all of that defaulted to Rome. He didn't have to worry about it. The only thing he had to do was make sure, one, that his people were at peace, and two, that he paid his taxes. And as long as the taxes got paid, and as long as the people were at peace, uh, then really, Herod could do whatever he wants. And so this is a pretty good setup for Herod. That's until he gets some troubling news. You see, as Herod is enjoying the peace of this season, he's enjoying his setup, we're told that Magi come to Jerusalem, and they begin to ask questions. They want to know where this child is at. This is what we read beginning in verse 2. They ask, where is the one? Where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. They've come to worship the king. Now that's problematic because Jerusalem already has a king. Jerusalem already has someone who are the, the people are supposed to worship. That someone is Herod. And the moment people show up and begin asking about Jesus, Herod realizes that his period of peace, this season of enjoying all that he has, is potentially disrupted. This is what we read when Herod got the news, verse 3. When he heard it, he was disturbed. And all of Jerusalem was disturbed with them. Suddenly these people are walking around asking other people, these magis, where's the king? Where's the king of the Jews? They want to see him. They want to 
They want to come and worship him. And again, Herod knows that if they do, if this child is really the king of the Jews, then there's some trouble coming his way. And so Herod tries to get some clarification. Herod tries to make sure he really understands. He wants to know if this kid really is the kid that the prophecy points to. And so Herod decides to call some of the religious leaders in and some of the teachers, and he begins asking them questions. Tell me about the prophecy. Tell me where this kid is to be born. And I imagine when he's asking that question, he's thinking to himself, don't say Bethlehem. Don't say Bethlehem. Don't say Bethlehem. Like If you say anywhere else other than Bethlehem, then he's good. Like he's got nothing to worry about. But of course, the religious leaders, the teachers, they answer him that the child is to be born in Bethlehem. Matter of fact, one of them actually quotes a prophecy from the Old Testament, from the book of Micah, chapter 5. This is what he says. He says, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. And who is that ruler? It's this baby. It's Jesus. And I can imagine at this point, Herod's getting a little nervous. He starts to play out his future, the ramifications of what this child means. And then he thinks, well, wait a second. It's just a baby. Like, I'm King Herod. Like, this is not a problem for me. All I have to do is figure out where this child is, then I can take care of it. Like, I can get rid of the child, no one has to worry about it, and peace for Herod would be restored. And so once he gets rid of the religious leaders, he brings in the Magi. Apparently the Magi know more about the presence of this child than anyone else in all of Jerusalem. And when he gets the Magi together, this is what he says in verse 7. He brings them together. He called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared, the star that guided them from the distant land to Jerusalem. I think it's so fascinating that Herod decided to call the Magi secretly. I find it so true in my life, and I'm sure many of you can resonate with it. It's often the times where we're trying to protect our own self-interest. It's often the times that we're trying to protect our own desires, that we go into hiding. We don't want anyone else to secretly know what we're wrestling with. And so Herod grabs the Magi, he brings them together secretly, and he asks them, where's this child? He's got an image to uphold. He doesn't want people to know. And if word got out that Herod was meeting with the Magi, then it would signal to the people that there's some insecurity, that Herod really isn't as powerful and strong as he displays himself to be. So Herod says, look, to the Magi, he goes, look, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go out. I want you to find the child. And when you find him immediately, come and tell me so that I can go and worship him. This is literally what Herod says in verse 8. Go and search carefully for the child. And as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Go and search carefully. Translation, literally overturn every stone, go through every house, look high and low, find the child. And when you find the child, come back to me, tell me where the child is so I can go and worship him. The truth is, Herod has no desire to worship the child. Herod does not care about the promise that this child brings. The truth is, Herod is only trying to protect himself. And see, Herod, like so many of us, believe that peace is found in our own self-satisfaction, in our own self-preservation. And so he's going to do whatever he can to protect himself. Because as long as he feels like he's safe, then he thinks he's at peace. But the truth is, the Magi show us a different way. The Magi show us where true peace comes from. Matter of fact, peace doesn't come from self-satisfaction. Peace doesn't come from self-preservation. What we learn from the Magi is that peace, true peace, everlasting peace, comes from self-surrender. So the Magi, they go out and they find their peace. In verse 9 we read that after they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. The the star continued to guide them on the journey to the place, to the house where Jesus was laying. And this is the Magi's response. When they saw the star, 
they were overjoyed. And who could blame them? I mean, they had traveled so far. They had been through so much to get to this moment. So much anticipation has built up. And here, right before his presence, they understand the significance of what this means. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down, and they worshipped him. When they saw the child, when they saw his mother, they did what you do in the presence of a king. They did the very thing that they set out to do the moment they left their homeland. They bowed down, and they worshipped Jesus. Worship is an act of surrender. These magi surrender their lives to Jesus. You see, I really believe that surrender is the only way that we will ever make sense of Christmas. Surrender is the only way we will ever find peace, not just in this crazy, chaotic, busy season, but in any season of our life. But that means we have to choose the path that we'll take. And the reality is some of us will continue to choose Herod's path. Some of us will decide that the peace that we seek comes from self-preservation. The the, the peace that we seek is going to come from us pursuing the things that we want. But I promise you, if that's the choice that you make, you will continually find yourself searching for something you will never find. Because as long as you are trying to build your kingdom, you will never be in, in peace when you're a part of God's kingdom. And that's what the Magi show us, that there is a different way, that there is a pathway to eternal peace. And it comes not from self-gratification, but it comes from self-surrender, that that is the key to everlasting peace. And we all want peace. In 1818, a young priest named Joseph Moore, penned really what has become known as the greatest Christmas carol in really history. Joseph Moore was a priest in Austria, in a small town in Austria, and as a country, Austria had just come off this brutal season of war. And for this short moment in their existence, in their life, they were experiencing peace. But Moore was wise enough to realize that peace is fleeting, Peace is temporary unless peace is found in the one who offers it everlasting. And so when Moore wrote the words, the words to the the song that is known as Silent Night, he was writing words that declared peace, but not just peace for a moment, but peace that would last forever because of Jesus. And those words, penned 201 years ago, continue to serve as a declaration of peace and a reminder that because of this child, life is possible for all of us. In the last 201 years, Silent Night has been translated in over 140 languages. And it has been sung in churches and in squares around the world in times of war but also in times of peace. There's a, there's a great story. In 1914, in the midst of World War I, and the brutality of that war, on a Christmas Eve, troops who fought to kill each other decided among themselves to have a ceasefire. On Christmas Eve night, So that they could spend time with one another. That they could spend time being reminded of the significance of what Jesus means to them and to this world. And the legend has it as they were enjoying their Christmas Eve dinners together, they began to hear the echoes of the enemy beginning to sing Silent Night. And one by one, in many different languages, they stopped doing what they were doing. And they started singing this song together as a declaration that peace, everlasting peace, is here in Jesus. And so we want to invite you tonight to join with us in declaring the same thing. 
When you came in, you were handed a candle. And if you didn't get a candle, no problem. In just a second, you can get up and you walk to the back and you can grab one. But some of our volunteers are going to come down the aisle and they're going to light the candles on the end. And I'm going to ask you to light the person's candle next to you. And when all of our candles are lit together, we're going to sing the song Silent Night. And I hope that as we do, you not only understand, but you feel the power in the words that we're singing. That everlasting peace is here through Jesus. When the Magi came to Jesus, they bowed down and they worshipped him. That's not the only thing that the Magi did. There's the other part of the story. The part that we really like. If for nothing else, then it's just really fun to say the words. And when the Magi, after they worshipped him, they opened up their gifts. They opened up their treasures. And they presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gifts fitting for a king. You know, one of the things I absolutely love about Christmas is the giving and receiving of gifts. It's a reminder for us that honestly, that there's more to life, there's more to this world than us. That there's sacrifice that happens when we give gifts to other people. But there's a part of that that we miss. It's a part that most of us miss at Christmas. Is that even though we're busy giving gifts to other people... We forget to give a gift to Jesus. And so as we wrap up tonight, we want to give you the opportunity to do just that. And maybe you're thinking, well, how do you give a gift to Jesus? Like, what does that look like? At least for the Magi, he was there. You know, what does it look like for us? Jesus is not going to open a gift in our presence. But here's what I really believe. You give a gift to Jesus every single time you give a gift to a person that Jesus died for. When you give the gift of peace, you are giving the gift of life and hope that is found in Jesus. As a family, this is something that we try to do. We don't do it every year, but every, every, every couple of years, we really try to take a moment to center ourselves, to be reminded that Jesus is really what this whole thing is about. And so a few years ago, we put together a gift, uh, gift catalog as a family, and we invited all of our family to pick a cause, to pick something they believed in, and that we would make a donation on their behalf, that it would be our gift to Jesus in this Christmas season. And the truth is, it's not something that I just do, we do as a family. It's also something that we try to live out and embody as a church. In the month of November, we participated in a campaign called Be Rich, a generosity initiative to really share the love and the hope of Jesus with our community. We talked about three things. We talked about giving, serving, and loving. And and we've been celebrating some of what God has done through that. It's crazy to think that collectively here at Lake Sawyer, we have, we have served over 300 volunteer hours through nonprofits in our local community. And we raised over $23,000, and we gave every single penny away from it, of that. Just gave it all away, because it was a gift to Jesus. It was the gift of Jesus. And we've been sharing with you some of the videos and some of the joy that that has brought to these organizations doing incredible work, but we saved one for you tonight. We saved a gift that we gave to an organization called Footprints of Fight. And Footprints is an organization here in the local area that really comes alongside families who have kids who are dealing and battling and fighting pediatric cancer. And they, they provide a little hope. They try to provide peace in this season. And that's what the gift of Jesus looks like. Watch this video. Everybody, we are so excited to be continuing our be in our Be Rich series. Well, it's the after effects of our Be Rich series, which is we are still giving money away. And today we are going to have so much fun because we are about to go and give a check to Footprints of Fight, which is an organization that is very dear to our hearts and especially to Charlene. She's here with me today because she not only is a part of Foot of Lake Sawyer on staff, but she's also a part of Footprints of Fight, one of the co-founders, and she's on the board and she's highly involved with Footprints. So we're really excited and we have a sneaky plan in place. So excited. 
<laughs> what are we doing, Charlotte? <laughs> we are going to the toy drive that Footprints of Fight holds annually. And uh, the other board members, co-founders, have no clue that this is about to happen. So we're so excited. We're going to sneak up on them. <laughs> feels a little creepy that we're like, know, go man. inside and we have like a video <laughs> camera on I'm you. I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> well, we're here because um, we did an amazing campaign recently through our church called Be Rich. And um, you guys were gracious to come and talk to us. And I, don't start because then I'll start. <laughs> and so we have had an incredible amount of generosity through our church for Be Rich and your organization is really close to our hearts and the people in our church just are um, absolutely grateful for what you do and the fact that you took a story that was really hard and you turned it into something beautiful is amazing. So we, <laughs> sorry. She's my spirit animal. Right? I know we <laughs> are. We have a gift to give to oh, you guys oh, wow. um, on behalf of Lake Sawyer Church to just say we think you're doing amazing work okay. and um, we love to just give that to you guys. Thank you. Thank and you I don't so know much. Much. You knew what? I'm supposed to open this. <laughs> yes, you're supposed to open it. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for this generous, generous check. You have no idea what this means to us as a family and as an organization and that you guys all band together and gave over and above to make Christmas and this next year even better for some of these families that are going through such a tough, tough time. It really... I can't even put into words what it means to us and to everyone who volunteers and gives everything they have to make Footprints of Fight what it is. Um, Santa's here and he just said God is so good and he really is, so thank you so much. I am so proud to be a part of a church that is so generous, who wants to make sure every person gets to experience the hope and the love that is possible in Jesus. And here's the thing, this is not just something that we do as a church. This is something that you get to do as your family as well. And in fact, that's what those envelopes are for. When you came in on your chair, there was an envelope that you, maybe you're sitting on that has the words Jesus on it. And it's there to remind us that on Christmas, that we have an opportunity to give a gift to Jesus, to give the gift of Jesus. And so what I want to encourage you to do is I want to encourage you to open that up. You're going to pull out, there's a piece of paper inside that envelope. And on that paper, this is what it says. Dear Jesus, this Christmas, we are celebrating your birthday in a special way. In your honor, we are giving the gift of blank, whatever that is, there's some op options there, to a cause or an organization that you believe in. We're thankful for your birth, which is the greatest gift we could ever receive. Love and write your family name. So here's the thing, I understand that even as I talk about this, like right away for some of you, there's a cause. There's an organization that you're passionate about, that you believe in, that you're thinking, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Like right when we end here, I'm going to go onto their website, I'm going to give a gift on their website, I'm going to fill out this card, and we can celebrate giving the gift of Jesus together tomorrow as a family. And if that's it, if you know what you would give to, you know the cause that you're passionate about, by all means, give to that cause. Make a difference. Do something with this opportunity. But I also understand that for some of you, you're like, I don't know where to give. I don't know who to give to. I, I don't know what causes that are good, that are making a difference. And so we wanted to help you with that. Because there's an organization that we partner with that we believe in deeply. 
And that organization is World Vision. And behind me, you're going to see that on, the, on the, the screen that there's a website there, donate.worldvision.org slash gift catalog. You don't have to write it down because we put that information in the envelope when you came in. And if you don't know where else to give, I'd encourage you to give to World Vision because World Vision is doing incredible things. World Vision is again and again, every day, giving the gift of Jesus, giving to the people that Jesus gave his life to. And there are causes both domestically and internationally that you could give to as a gift to Jesus. And maybe this is your first time here. And you're like, this is a new church was going to ask me for money. I knew this was going to happen. And so like, this is a trigger word for you. So here's the thing. We wanted to make this super easy. If you're new... This is your first time here. We believe so much in the benefit of doing this that we're going to do it for you. We're going to give a gift on your behalf. The only thing we're going to ask you to do is when the service is over, you can go to the information desk or you can go to guest center right behind me, show up, fill out a brief card, tell them how many people are in your family. And for every person in your family, through World Vision, we're going to give a chicken. And you might be thinking, "What's what's the use of a chicken? Well, that chicken not only provides nutrition for that family, but it also provides a source of income. In this crazy world that we live in, that might be the peace that these people need. And we're going to do that for you. No strings attached. Just go to the back, fill out a card, tell us how many people are in your family, and we'll give that gift. The last thing, whatever it is, whether it's through World Vision, whether we make the gift for you, or there's another organization that you believe in, I want you to do this tonight. I want you to fill out this card. I want you to put it back in the envelope. And I want you to put the card on your tree. And tomorrow morning, when you wake up with your family, or maybe it's just you and a friend or you and your spouse, I want you to start your day by opening that envelope and being reminded of yourself, remind your family that that's what this is all about. That Jesus gave his life so that we would have peace. That's the joy of Christmas. That's why we celebrate. And we want you to experience it as well. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Merry Christmas.